Next week, I'm going to be starting into a new sermon series, and we'll be, uh, we'll be going through the book of James. But uh, this week, I, I was just praying and asking God for direction on, on what uh, He wanted me to speak on, and um, He dropped something onto my heart that I'd like to share with you today. Now, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, It's written this. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's quite a unsettling scripture, and it paints a picture of some very dire circumstances in the world out there. And I don't know about you, but when you look at what's taking place all around, I don't think there's a truer picture of what seems to be taking place in our generation in the world right now than what I just read. All you need to do is turn on our government-sponsored CBC radio station and listen for an hour or watch this year's Grammy event unfold to observe the absolute disparity, the ungodly culture that our, our nation and North America has come to. Seems as though our society is tearing apart at the seams and is in complete moral freefall. Seems everywhere you go now, darkness is called out as being light and wrong is embraced as being right. You guys know this. We live in this world and it rubs shoulders with us on a daily basis. But coming to this realization, we have to wrestle with this question. Since the world is in this state, how then should we as Christians react to all of it? How should we behave? How should we live? As believers in Jesus, we can become fixated on the troubling events taking place around us, and some of us can actually get caught up and absorbed into some of the darkness that is that is so pervasive, letting things in this world get a grip on us, or letting the things in this world get under our skin, depress us, infuriate us, or cause us anxiety. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know this today. The truth of the matter is that despite how dark it is on the outside in our culture, Our God is still in control. And sometimes I think that we forget that our God can even use unconverted world leaders for the good of His people and the progress of His sovereign work in this world. As unpleasant as it was for His children in the past, we see stories of how God raised up Pharaoh in Egypt so he could demonstrate his power in setting his people free. As unpleasant as it was for Jesus and his disciples, the Lord even used wicked Herod and Pontius Pilate to accomplish his plan in setting the stage for the crucifixion, which actually led to the resurrection and the establishment of a new covenant in Christ Jesus' blood, setting sinners free. We're a result of that today. Thank you, Jesus. But outside of these examples today, I'd like to speak with you about another time where God used an ungodly, unconverted king to accomplish his divine purposes and actively demonstrate that the Lord God is completely and absolutely in control over the affairs of men. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them with you, or if you want to follow along on the overhead. Our text this morning is Isaiah chapter 45. 
Isaiah 45. Starting with verse 1. This is what the Lord says to His anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before Him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before Him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and I will level mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. For the sake of, my, of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord God, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So when we read this passage of Scripture, we start into it. Before we can kind of talk about what's happening here, I think it's important for us to understand the, the purpose that God had in calling this man Cyrus, the context and the background to it. It's essential, actually, that we understand the context of what's happening here so that we can see what God is saying to us today. Now, at the time when this was written, Isaiah the prophet in his age, God had numerous prophets that were speaking out and they were warning the people of Israel that the Lord was about to exile them to Babylon because they had been so polluted, they had become so polluted with idol worship that they needed to be broken of it. Although God's people had been given the commandments of God, they were disregarding them actively. Instead of following the Lord wholeheartedly, they embraced the evil practices of the Canaanites, the region in which they had possessed the land, was, uh, was possessed by Canaanites before that. And those people were uprooted from the land, and the Israelites were placed in that land because of the wickedness of, that, of those people. They were committing sexual immorality by worshiping the god Ashtoreth, the goddess Ashtoreth, I should say. And they did this in the name of, of improving their fertility. They were also sacrificing their children to the Baals to obtain prosperity. There was a statue of Baal called Moloch. And they would, they would try to gain prosperity for their land and, their, and their, their business dealings by taking a child and throwing a child onto the burning hot arms of this pagan idol. They sacrificed their children. Yet here, God has something to say. You see, when the children of Israel were established as a nation, they had periods. If you notice, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see one king came in and the children of Israel were led into wickedness and they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then another king came in and uh, he'd do evil in the sight of the Lord. And another, but sometimes there would be... Uh, a king that would come in that would serve the Lord with, with, his, with his heart and the people would be encouraged to turn away from idolatry and there would be the, the, the seesawing back and forth. And when the people were doing evil, God brought down his judgment in small measures upon the people during those times. And when they were obedient to the Lord and they obeyed his word, then God would, would bless them and they would see thing, their, their culture rise during those times. But this kept cycling, and more and more evil kept being embraced by the people. And God sent his prophets to warn. He said, I'm going to send you guys into captivity. And Isaiah the prophet was speaking about this along with different prophets like Jeremiah. They were speaking about these things and warning the people as God gave them the words to warn them. But here in this prophecy... 
before they even went into exile, God used Isaiah to prophesy that after a period of exile, once he had broken them of their idolatrous practices, he would reestablish them in the land of promise. He mentions the emperor of Persia by name, saying that he was going to anoint and use Cyrus to accomplish his purposes. And this was even though Cyrus did not um, or would not acknowledge the Lord. He was, going, he was calling Cyrus and he says, even though you don't acknowledge me prophetically, yet I'm going to use you to deal with my people and bring them back from captivity. Now this prophecy was given 150 years before it was fulfilled when Cyrus the Great of Persia liberated the people through Darius of bondage to Babylon. See, Babylon was a tyranny. And the people of Israel cried out under the weight of this tyranny. Nebuchadnezzar, the founder of the Babylonian regime, if you read the book of Daniel, was an absolute tyrant. And God permitted the Israelites to be captured by Nebuchadnezzar and taken away to serve him for the purpose of breaking the, the wickedness and idolatry that was resident within them that needed to be taken care of. Because, why? Because God loves his people and he doesn't want his people to embrace and live in a state of wickedness. So, when we look at this, in Isaiah 45, God says this, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do these things. Now, prior to Cyrus coming on the scene, the Israelites, I mentioned, they were living in oppression under their Babylonian captors. When something bad happens to God's people, sometimes we get the impression that it is just the fact that Satan has somehow gained dominion over the land and brings about all this wickedness and he, he just sort of, so there's this, this picture that God's almost like he's not on, on, in control of things. That Satan's kind of gained the upper hand. I want you to know today that the scripture makes it abundantly clear that is completely false. There is, there is nothing that is not under the control of the Lord God. He is the only God that there is. There is no God beside him. And if he allows his people to undergo difficulties, persecution, even hardships like, like war and pestilence, if he allows that, he's doing it for a reason. He is not the author of evil, but he allows things to take place. Now, in this context of this passage we're reading here, God saw fit to purge His chosen people of their vices of idolatry through suffering. To those Israelites, when they're under Nebuchadnezzar's regime, maybe they felt like Nebuchadnezzar had the upper hand. But in Isaiah chapter 45, we see that God lays out the plan ahead of time to ensure that they understand that it is not Nebuchadnezzar who is going to be controlling the outcomes for the people of God. God is in control of the outcomes. Nebuchadnezzar has his place. And I think if you look in the book of Daniel, we won't get into that. Nebuchadnezzar says, look at what I built. And God just humbled him. And he, got, he went mad and had to eat grass like, uh, like, a, like a cow out in the fields for a time. 
until he acknowledged that the Lord is God over all the kingdoms of the earth, right? But Cyrus, okay, the prophecy I read to you is relevant, I think, today. The whole thing that I just read to you about Cyrus, it's relevant today. Our Lord God is one. He is unchanging from the time before time to the present day and into the future. He does not change. There is no shadow of turning with our God. You see, God in character, He treats all people the same way. What that means is that He's going to treat us the same way as He treats everyone else. And the book the books we see in the Bible are meant for us to be examples of what we can read so that we can learn and so that we don't have to repeat the same errors that were made because the whole cycle is shown of how people, when they become polluted by the things of this world, the judgment of God needs to come down on that, and it will come down on that. If it's God's people who are embracing evil, God's judgment will come down upon that. We will be exiled, taken into captivity until that is broken out of us. Because God loves you and I so much, He doesn't want us to cycle in this state. I hope this is making sense. Now, as a Gentile church, most of us here are Gentiles. Maybe there's the odd person with Jewish, Jewish heritage, but most of us are Gentiles. We're a Gentile church. We are rooted into the, the root of the patriarchs. We are the children of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you've asked Him to be your Savior and Lord, and you've submitted your life to Him, you are a child of God. You're rooted into the... You're, you're grafted into the root of the patriarchs and in Galatians 3, 7 and 9, it's written, Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So just as God's promises to his people were made, in the same spirit, God speaks to us. If we, as his church, like the ancient Israelites of those days, begin to stray into compromising with the world around us, like the Israelites did in rejecting God's ways, and we embrace the Canaanite ways, God will treat us in the same manner as he treated Israel. In our day, we may not commit fornication with temple prostitutes like the Israelites did for the purpose of trying to increase their fertility, but I would ask this. This morning, this is between you and God. This morning, are you participating in these things? Are you allowing immorality into your homes through your screens and through your devices? Are you listening to or watching the ungodly productions of this world's media and stirring up ungodly sensuality with the goal of trying to enhance somehow the fertility of your life? If you're doing this, my friends, you're living in contrary spirit to what God desires for His children. You're worshipping those things as a god of sensuality just as much as the Israelites worship the god Ash goddess Ashtoreth. And if this is happening, this is happening. You're setting the stage for God's corrective discipline and God is calling you to repent. He's calling you to repent. Now, on another level, we may not sacrifice our children on the arms of Molech like the children of Israel did, but are we sacrificing our children's spiritual well-being by trying to get ahead in this world? 
by prioritizing other things above God that will end up facilitating the spiritual death of our children? Are we sacrificing things, are sacrifices being made to enrich our lives through material pursuits of this world? The pursuit of fame and glory and money and hobbies. Are these being done at the expense of our family's spiritual well-being? Because if they are, it's the same sin as the Israelites sacrificing their children. Because in both cases, there is death that results. Friends, all of us here were born sinners. There's not one person here that can say that they're without sin. And thank Jesus, by the grace of God, He has forgiven us of our sins. And by the blood of Jesus, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. This is a gift from God, not of ourselves, lest any one of us should boast. But the Lord God who saved us calls out to his people, Be holy, for I am holy. Thus says the Lord, Be holy, for I am holy. Why do we do this? We do this not because by works are we saved, but we do this as an act of worship, a spiritual act of worship to the Lord who is deserving of our entire allegiance out of love for Him. He desires it. God has a plan for His church in the world, both universally and locally. Just as He used kings and political systems in the ancient Israel days, he uses political leaders and systems of the world today to accomplish his purposes. And sometimes we have to endure some hardship and maybe micro hardships to try and turn us. But if we don't learn from these micro hardships, sooner or later there's going to be some kind of exile that takes place because God loves us too much to let us get away with it because it's not in his will for us to live that way. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, Luke tells us this. He says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So, what are you saying, Pastor? Well, when we see evil around us, the days are dark, just like we read in the first paragraph there. I read that first scripture. The days around us are dark. And when we see evil triumphing and, and rising in our culture and in our midst, God wants us to remember that the devil is not in control. Yes, he's permitted, but he is not in control. God is in control. The Lord might be trying to teach us something important through this mini-exile that we've experienced. Hasn't the last few years been like a mini-exile in some ways? It has, hasn't it? Well, maybe God's trying to get our attention. Maybe He's trying to prune our lives so that we can become more fruitful. Our tendency in the flesh is to lash out in anger or fear because we don't like being uncomfortable. We're in a culture of comfort. We don't like being unsettled. We don't like being uncomfortable. But people, God often uses modern-day Nebuchadnezzars on both a smaller scale and a larger scale to break us out of our idolatrous behaviors. We don't have to be afraid or feel as though we've been abandoned. And this is the point today. God does not wish you or I or any of his children to be destroyed. Rather, he desires that our attitudes, actions, and motivations for doing things be reformed and conformed to his image. Rather than getting upset and trying to fight his discipline, he desires us to press towards him and adopt an attitude of humility and thanksgiving when things are dark and difficult. What God really wants from us is when we can undergo trials of diverse kinds, whatever they might be, we look to him and go, what are you trying to teach me through this, Lord? 
I know that you're trying to teach me something. Otherwise, you wouldn't let me go through this. You're sovereign over all, and you see my heart. You see everything around me. I don't understand necessarily what's going on or why this is happening the way it is, but you do, God. I place my trust in you, and I'm asking, Lord, that you would take my heart, that you'd rend it, Lord. Teach me, God, what you're trying to say to me through this trial. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's an action. Maybe it's a motive that God is trying to get you to shed. See, in our flesh, in this state, when we're going undergoing trials, we're, we feel like we need to take matters into our own hands, don't we? And try and make things better, somehow make things better. And rather than praying and leaving it in God's hands, we try and fight the battles that, in our own human strength, we were never meant to fight. And the truth of the matter is that uh, <laughs> Satan ha- is not and never has been God's opposite. You understand that? <laughs> Satan has not and he'll never be God's opposite. There is only one God. He's not the author of evil, but He is the lower of evil, and his eye is on his children. He allows things to take place so that his children can be brought closer to him. If God could further his eternal purpose by allowing his son to die a wicked, unjust death on the cross, then he knows how to use our circumstances of suffering under his watchful eye to further his eternal eternal purposes in and through us as well. Faith is trusting in God. God wants us to trust Him when things are hard. Once things had been taken care of, once God's corrective discipline had taken taken place over 70 years in exile in Babylon, It was time. It was time for rebuilding and restoration. It's the same way that God knows when it's time for a disciplinary process to be over on a micro scale inside of us or inside of our church locally or inside of the church nationally or the church globally even. The the Lord knows how exactly when to administer what is needed to accomplish His purpose. And God loves us. And, and you know, there are little Cyruses that God sends into our lives. And sometimes, in our nation, God might send a big Cyrus to overthrow the tyranny and to bring people back to him so that they can rebuild, so that they can worship him in freedom. See the cycle? After what we've needed to learn through a trial and our sinful actions or motives have been purged from us, God lovingly brings us back to be reestablished and to grow us stronger. And this is where we come to the promise of God in Second Chronicles chapter 13, uh, chapter 13, 14, thir- uh, sorry, Second Chronicles, for some reason I don't have the text here. Ah, 7, 13 and 14, my notes, that's the chapter. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague amongst my people, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God is true to his character. He always has been and he always will be. So this promise stands true throughout the ages, even here today. If we find ourselves under oppressive circumstances, God calls for us to humble ourselves and pray and seek His face. He calls us to pray. 
to ask Him to forgive us when He reveals things to us that need to shift and need to shed so that He may have um, the rebuilding taking place and the fruit of the Spirit amongst the entire body that He's called by His name. God may use that Cyrus to bring down a Babylonian-like tyrant. Right? Just keep that in mind. Make no mistake. God can use an ungodly politician and an ungodly system to refine His church and bring them to their knees. And that's where we need to be. Just as easily as He can overthrow that political system of oppression and restore a church through a season of newfound freedom and growth using a different politician and a different system, even though that politician or system doesn't even acknowledge him. God uses it to accomplish his purposes with his people. Why? Because he is God, and besides him there is no other. God permits kings and kingdoms to rise, and he permits kings and kingdoms to fall. Behind all of the drama that we see in the events around us today, there is a God that is planning for His church. And who is His church? His church are the people who are called by His name, people that have submitted their lives to Him and have asked Jesus to be their Savior. And the Spirit of God comes inside of that person and makes them a new creation, born again. And collectively, where two or more gathered, there He is. In, there He is. That's the church. We are the church. The people are the church. Through affliction and persecution, chastening and tribulation, to be perfected and to be prepared to inherit the kingdom of God. We're foolish to believe that we can control the outcomes of the work of God that He's trying to accomplish in us. What we need to do is recognize it for what it is and yield. Yield to the Lord. Humble ourselves and, and pray. Isaiah continues, You heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker, those who are nothing but potsherds among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its Maker. Concerning the things to come, do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind in it, on it. My own hands have stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry host. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all of his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and he will set my exiles free. But not for a price or reward, says the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt, the merchandise of Cush, and those tall Sabians, they will come over to you and will be yours. They will trudge behind you, coming over to you in chains. They will bow down before you and plead with you, saying, Surely God is with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly you are a God who's been hiding himself, the God and Savior of Israel. All the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgraced. They will go off in disgrace together. But listen to this. But Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgrace to ages everlasting. For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth and He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. 
So in conclusion of the matter, it's this. God is the great architect of our universe. We're in good hands. Not only is he the architect of the universe, but he is good. And his mercy endures forever. You see, as his people, we're not responsible for the outcomes. Only Jesus is. That being said, God gives us choices. Choices. Whether we choose to submit ourselves to him or resist him, it's going to determine how things are going to play out for us. When we yield to God, he will do things, good things, in and through us. But if we are disobedient, we will come under the Lord's corrective discipline. That being said, although King Nebuchadnezzar is of this world and King Cyrus is of this world, will be around, and they'll be around till Jesus comes back again. <laughs> They're nothing but a speck of dust compared to your God. He sees beyond all things. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. So we humble ourselves and we pray. God, help us to renounce secret and shameful ways of human idolatry. And Lord, help us to honor you and to serve you in holiness as our spiritual act of worship. We can't do this alone. We need the Holy Spirit's help to be the people that God has called us to be. And he's given us that provision, my friends. You have been given the treasury of heaven in the Holy Spirit. And you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you are the body of Christ. And each one of you as a believer is part of that. Now there's going to be seasons where we come under oppression. And there's going to be seasons where we're liberated as we, we finally get it, you know? The old Clint, you know? It's pretty slow to learn sometimes. I would venture to say the old you is pretty slow to learn sometimes too because we're all like that, right? But God's patient with us. And he's loving and he grooms us. And he's giving us the chance, right, to, to serve him wholeheartedly, to bow before him, to pray and seek his face. And God's not finished with us. He's not finished. Philippians 1, 3 to 6 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What a promise. You see, God sent this prophecy ahead of the captivity of Israel to show them that he's not just trying to bean them for no reason. He's trying to Bring them around so that they are conformed to him. And in closing, I'll just read the last couple of verses here. And this is Isaiah saying this in verse 21. Declare what it is, what it, what is to be. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow. By me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and will be put to shame. But the, all of the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. And as his church, as a Gentile church, we are grafted into that promise. Amen? Let us pray.